Uh, welcome to this meeting in the Economic Society of Australia, Queensland. My name is Timothy Wanhoff, and I am the immediate past president of the society. Uh, the current president, Flavio Menezes, uh, he's traveling today. He can't be here. He regrets he can't be here. In fact, he's gutted. Um, I would like to acknowledge the support of Morgan's and thank Morgan's Financial Limited for offering us this space to hold this event. And I'd like to thank the society secretary, Jean Tunney, uh, and uh, Harriet for all the work they did in putting this together. Now, in many cases, irrational behavior have perfectly good reasons to exist. In fact, what we think of as rational behavior, behavior might not be irrational at all uh, when we understand and take a closer look at why people do what they do. There's a whole field of economics focus on this, and it's, be called, it's called uh, behavioral economics. An emerging expert in this field is Lionel Page. Lionel is a professor at the Queensland University of Technology and a research leader at uh, the Queensland Behavioral Economics Group we know as CUBE. He has a distinguished background, having completed graduate degrees at some of Paris's finest institutions and worked as a research fellow and associate at the University of Cambridge and also uh, Westminster. He has an MA in economics from the Pantheon Sorbonne University, an MA in econometrics from NCA, and a PhD from the Paris School of Economics. In many ways, he has the best of the old and the new. The Paris School of Economics was uh, rebranded in 2006, has a new funding model, and has rapidly taken its place as one of the um, great institutions of economic research in the world. Its advisory council includes the likes of Olivier Blanchard, Amartya Sen, James Release, and Joseph Stiglitz. Thomas Piketty is a well-known alumni. Lionel's work has been published extensively in the economic journal, the American Economic Review, its European equivalent, and the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. So it may not surprise you uh, that this year Lionel was the recipient of the Economic Society's Young Economist Award. Now this is awarded to an economist under the age of 40 uh, who is working in Australia and seems to have made a significant contribution to the economics discipline. Lionel's work focuses upon choice under risk and uncertainty, behavior and competition, as well as political and educational choices. He's, investiga uh, he's investigated information acquisition and predictive markets, things like election markets, exit polls, uh, turnout and, bandwidth and bandwagon voting. So as a dual citizen of Australia and the United States, I'm very keen to know what he has to think about the upcoming competition between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, uh, and the relative attractiveness of third-party third candidates uh, in a non-preferential voting system. Uh, if I seem depressed, it is only because I am. <laughs> uh, in a moment, I will invite Lionel to the podium. He will speak for approximately 25 minutes. This will be followed by a Q&A session, and then our Vice President, Julian Pierce, will come up to give a vote of thanks with no further ado, uh, I give you Lionel Page. Thank you, Jim, for this very kind introduction. And thank you for the ESA uh, to uh, uh, organize this event and to um, have me as a speaker today. Uh, so when I was invited to, uh, to give a talk today, I was wondering what would be interesting uh, for the ESA in this context. And I thought that this topic that I've chosen would be quite timely uh, because Behavioral economics has been very successful over the recent years. It has left kind of this small circle of academia to be now, uh, you have uh, um, bestsellers in behavioral economics, which you can find in the non-fiction -se section in, in the airport. You'll have uh, uh, government and industry bodies um, uh, hiring behavioral economists to help them solve their business problems. And so lots of people are talking about behavioral economics. But uh, as a consequence also that, uh, the understanding that the inside of behavioral economics sometimes is not, uh, uh, can be simplified. And something I hear a lot uh, is that behavioral economics is about showing that people are irrational, that people make mistakes, and just people are not very good at making decisions. And today what I want to, to show you is that um, uh, this is kind of a reduction of the insight we have. What we have gained over the recent years is an understanding that the uh, traditional model of economic behavior doesn't work. So people don't conform to the traditional assumptions of economic behavior. It doesn't mean that the way, what people do is necessarily bad. And in some ways, we're understanding that 
the assumptions, the initial assumptions, were ne not necessarily the right answers to the complexity of the world we are living in. So that's why I, wa I want to show you. So I could talk about this stuff for ages. So I'm go just going to give a few examples to try to plant the seed into uh, your mind that uh, some of the things which we think are uh, default mistakes, there may be good reasons for that because actually in the, the real world we're living it, uh, in it, uh, it's, uh, it's the, the results of processes which are, which are going to help you make good decisions, usually. Uh, so, so what is the traditional model of Homo economicus, the, the rational economic uh, man, which was the standard that we had in economics uh, for um, uh, until like 20 or 15 years ago? Well, this is a, a person which is rational, who is rational, doesn't, is not driven by emotions and passion and pulsions, cool-minded. Typically, this is a person who is very good at math. Uh, sometimes we assume that this person was able to solve some equations which require our computers a few hours to solve. Uh, and, and this person only care about money. Uh, so a good way, if, I want, if you want to picture out what this person looked like, I think this would be a good representation. <laughs> and, and if this guy doesn't look like you and me, there's, yeah, that's, that's normal. Uh, this, uh, this guy does only care about money, doesn't care about other people. He's not, um, he doesn't care positively or negatively. He's very indifferent, so he, he doesn't have um, empathy for other people, but he doesn't have a, a envy or, or spitefulness. You know, it's just a guy, a bit like, you know, it's nothing's personal, it's just business. <laughs> he's not a mean person. So this guy for us as economists is great because it simplifies when we want to write models to describe the world, it's easy. He's good at math, so we can assume that he's solving all problems that we write in mathematics. Uh, he's rational, he's very, uh, there's no emotions. Emotions are tricky, so that makes it simple to, to think about how we think about the world. And he cares about money, so there's one dimension. He cares about one dimension. That's very simple. So for us, it was very convenient to use this model to try to explain plenty of things. And we have to give it to economics. Um, and I'm, I'm not somebody who bashes up standard economics. Uh, we have to give it to economics that this is a very usual, useful model to explain plenty of things. Okay. But then, um, in spite of the fact that we can explain plenty of things, this is not really um, uh, the, a, a good model for, uh, to explain what real people are. And here's more, more like somebody like we are, an homo sapiens. <laughs> and I think if it works in this original series, it's because you know, it really works on this kind of duality, like the uh, perfect rational guy versus the, the human with his uh, weaknesses. So what, what characterizes these guys? How is he different from the previous one? Well, this one, for instance, he, he makes mistakes. Uh, this one, he has social feelings. Uh, and this one has emotions, right? <laughs> All the kind of stuff that the other one didn't have. And so, um, in this series, actually, it's often presented as weaknesses, but weaknesses which makes him stronger. And actually, it's exactly that. The other, this, this could be seen as weaknesses, but actually, these make, uh, make him uh, stronger. And so, I'm not going to talk about specifically these three things, but I'm going to give you a few examples about the things which makes us human, but makes us actually good at answering and addressing the problems we are facing in the real world. So I'm going to start with uh, attention, and I have, a, I have a small movie. I would like to look carefully at the movies, but being very careful and being, uh, uh, paying attention. Uh, so if you're ready, this should work. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's right, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was 
polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, um, I love the way people react when they see it. Uh, the, the way I reacted, I guess, um, um, uh, when I saw it for the first time. Uh, so, uh, uh, here what you see is, uh, you were focused, I'm sure we wanted to pay very much attention to, to the video, but you missed plenty of things. It's amazing what we can miss. But I think that the, um, uh, uh, the insight that we get is not so much about uh, the fact that we're uh, mistaken, it's the complexity of the task you, were, you had to face. Uh, if you think about when you have a camera and you take a picture, a picture is a few meg of data. Then now, if you think about the flow of pictures coming when you watch this movie, it's you know, maybe uh, um, tens of megs of data that you have to process. It's a lot of information, lots of visual information. But your brain has to do a lot of, of, of work when processing this information. So uh, in, the, uh, in the cortex, uh, at least like 50% of the cortex is involved in processing visual information. Visual information is very, very demanding. So what your brain is doing when you're, when you're looking at this stuff is uh, trying to focus on what's important. And your brain is designed uh, for decisions, making decisions, evaluating options, and deciding which option is the best and what, uh, what decision to make. And we, we, we were not designed by evolution to kind of you know, just enjoy aesthetic views of the world and, 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 and um, not related decision, to decisions. It's about should I go here or there? Should I uh, say yes or no? Should I eat this stuff or not eat this stuff? And that's what uh, we are, uh, the brain is designed for, to make decisions. So when I invite you to watch this video and you have a strong uh, criminal uh, narrative to it, you are going to look for, to make a decision, which is who is a criminal. All your attention, and you are attentive, your attention is going to be focused on this thing. So your brain is going to be uh, selecting information, eliminating information, ignoring irrelevant information to focus on what's really key. In this flow of data that is going to your brain, you want to focus on what's really key. And what's really key is going to be uh, what they say, who has an unlikely inconsistent alibi, you hear what they say, you are going to look at their faces to, sign, to look for signs of deceit, uh, emotional reactions revealing that they are lying, uh, or they're the inconsistent. That's what you're going to focus on. That as you are doing so, you are going to be uh, blind to all the rest because you cannot focus on everything. You have to focus on what matters the most. And that's going to be the optimal allocation of your cognitive resources in this complex problem. Uh, here's another example to show you that you can work with limited information and understand and make inferences. So this is a sentence with lots of mistakes in it. Even though there's lots of mistakes in it, you're able to read it and to make sense of these, world, uh, these words. So it's written, this is a sample, uh, sample sentence to test your brain's ability to correct mistakes. Okay. And why are you able to read this sentence even though, even though there are lots of mistakes? It's because actually information in, in the real world is redundant. Okay. There's, you don't need all the letters to be in the right place to find the word. So you can use limited information to make correct inferences. And, and your brain can use the fact that information is redundant to use a limited set of information to make uh, inferences. So, in particular, what, what you have here that something which is very useful for you to work out this uh, problem is that the first and the last letter of each word is in the right place, as well as a few letters in, in the word. And that's going to help you fill the dots. Okay? And what you have to realize is that in everyday life, that's what we're doing, filling the dots. Our brain is filling the dots all the time. You have a model of the world, and you can't keep track of everything. As long as you can fill the dots, you're working well. Here's another example. Do you, do you, know, do you think you can find out what's uh, written? Do you have a candidate? Well, I think, I think you would say maybe something like jumping to conclusions. A and that would be jumping to conclusions, because that's not <laughs> jumping to conclusions. So that that's example shows you uh, the cost that you will face when you use limited information to make inferences. It's going to work plenty of time, but sometimes you have to make mistakes. Okay? But as long as these kind of mistakes are very rare, and we agree that this thing is very rare, it's highly unlikely that we face these kind of words in, you know, in text. As long as these mistakes are very rare, then you should, you choose, you should uh, trade off, accept to make these small mistakes, and be right most of the time. You can be right quickly with limited information, 
the price you have to pay, you are going to make some mistakes. And your brain is making this trade-off. So making mistakes is not a problem. It's like, it's like if you were, uh, uh, you know, another example, like um, uh, if, you, if you want to make, on average, uh, have the, make the best decisions, you need to, to, to allow mistakes. And, and an example, a friend of mine was saying that if you are uh, never uh, missing a plane, maybe you're spending too much time at the airport. Okay, that's the same thing. If you, the zero mistake paradigm, if you want to look for never making any mistakes, you're, you're, this is a too costly uh, solution. So you want to allow for some mistakes, and that's the case. As long as this is unfrequent enough, you should allow for this kind of thing. Um, another example about how the brain is used limited information. Um, so you have this square, or this rectangle, and you can see you have a, a gradient from uh, left to right. And I think it's because I, I press my clicker. Um, right. Um, so you have this gradient. And it looks like uh, the, the rectangle inside, you have a grain as well from left to right in the opposite direction. And actually, what you see is that when you, I remove what's around, there is no gradient. That was a visual illusion. And it's striking, and there is no trick, right? I'm not tricking you with changing or creating a gradient. And I put the rectangle back, and you, know, you think that it looks like there is a gradient, but there is none. So what was ha what's happening here? Well, let's think about. You know, as I say, your brain is designed to make decisions, evaluating options, and often you just need to look at differences. You know, is this darker than, than this stuff? Is it closer than this stuff? Uh, and so, the brain could uh, look at points and evaluate the uh, location of these colors on, on a gradient of color and say, okay, that point is at that, this location, this point is this location. And then you would have, here you would have six points. We'll have to do six evaluations for me, for instance. Or your brain could just think, you know, I just care about differences. That's what's key, is to make assessments. This stuff is far away, close. Or, or. So I want to, to look at this thing. I want to compare things. I don't need the absolute values of each thing. So I need to look at the differences. And that's what, if your brain does that, then you have only three things you need to care about, three differences. You have half the amount of information you need to, to look at this picture and make sense of it. And that's what your brain does. Your brain looks, uh, uh, uses a lot of contrast, uh, uh, differences to make um, inferences. And that's why you're tricked here because, uh, because you have indeed, it's darker this side. In, within the rectangle, it's relatively lighter, so it looks lighter. At the other end, it's lighter, and then the bar inside looks relatively darker. And that's what tricks your brain. But once again, it's, it's a very good principle to use limited information. It tricks you in this very specific case. But as long as these kind of cases are not too frequent, that's not a problem. I'm going to show, I think, a very interesting example to, to, uh, in practice why this, is, uh, why this, this works. Um, this is a robot team, or football team of UNSW. Uh, we actually won the uh, World Cup in uh, robot soccer against a German team, I think, two years or three years ago. These are uh, robots, uh, the, all the hardware is given, so they're not building the robots. Their only task is to build a program. So now they face a, pr a problem such as, you know, these robots have limited uh, um, uh, memory and they need to use optimally this uh, um, computing capacity from the robot to solve problems. And so these, these robots typically they have to, uh, uh, they have to uh, look around, find the ball, find the, uh, um, the teammates and the opposition teammate. They have to move to decide to move and they have to do some decision making. I don't know, move this way, move that way, pass the ball or kick at the goal, etc. And you may think uh, that when you play football, uh, the, the trickiest thing when you want to program robots to play football is the decision, the strategy. You know, and should we play one to one or uh, one tree? Uh, where should people be placed to pass the ball, etc.? Well, the reality is exactly like us. The most demanding um, uh, thing for these robots is vision. Vision consumes most of the computational resources because it's a very complex problem to make sense of all this information coming through the cameras of the robots. And here again, exactly like what your brain does, the programmers use contrast differences in colors to make inferences. So to identify where is a ball, they use a contrast gradient uh, in colors. So they don't say, oh, a ball looks like that. Here's a ball. They are going to look for variations in colors. And as soon as they find a shape, which is uh, you have gradations, gradient, and it's, it's in, within a circle, they can estimate. They, the computer says, okay, that's a ball. Okay. So the same principle of reduction of this wealth of information to use simple principles to make a decision 
we realize that when we want to solve the problem that our brain is trying to solve, we use the same solutions. And uh, here's an example that maybe a few of us you know already. Uh, 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 so if we move from the, the in, in consequence of this in economic uh, settings. So suppose you, you, you are a Starbucks owner and you sell uh, coffee and you have a tall and a grande uh, cup of coffee. And these are your sales. All good. Uh, but suppose that when you, you, you decide to, to create a new thing, which is called the venti, which is very large, and not, know that people are not very keen on your venti. You know, it's not like, it's not a preferred option. But what's interesting here is uh, that the ratio of people uh, buying tall or grandy has changed. So in the first case, people took more tall than grandy. And in the second situation, when you, once you add the venti, they start getting more grandy than tall. So why could it be the case? I mean, we know that that's what happens. So you, if we put a store with coffee and we do this, that's what happens. By the way, that's why when you go to restaurants, there's an option which is very expensive, and you think, oh, I shouldn't get this stuff. But as a consequence of not getting the very expensive option, you take the second expensive options. So that's, uh, that works. So why, why, why would that happen? Is it, you know, uh, Dan Ali uses this, this um, example a lot, and, and lots of uh, psychologists or, or even behavioral economists think that means that people are just irrational. But if you think that we use differences, this is, this is very easy to understand. You use contextual differences. You come to this shop and, as a customer and you think, you know, I have a moderate taste for coffee today, uh, but what is the best answer to my moderate taste for coffee? So when you are in this, uh, in the first case, well, you know, and you have a small and a big option. I don't know, it's kind of 50-50 maybe. Um, maybe grand is too much. Anyway, so in this case, people moderate test for coffee may be satisfied by a tool. But then suppose this is now the choice set you face. Well, you can see, well, the grand is bigger than the tool, but it is smaller than the venti. So can, if you know, maybe that's the right answer for my moderate test for coffee, right? And, and that can explain why people move, because you use your contextual information. So, here in this case, what it is is that it's a very good principle. Most of the time, using contextual information to infer uh, which option you should choose is going to work. But the thing is that you know the marketers find out that they can you know frame then use this to, to frame the, the choice set such as to induce something which is good for them. Uh, but as long as you know, I mean, we were not designed to face this kind of problem. But there are good reasons why we would we would behave that way. Okay. So that first that first part was about individual decisions. You face individual decisions and, and sometimes it may seem that we are making mistakes and that it is uh, uh, irrational, but I wanted to show that in lots of these cases are good reasons why you should have limited attention and why you should make mistakes in some cases. Here I think it's, more inter it's, it's another um, a dimension when you, you look at people interacting with each other. So I'm, I'm interested here in, in self-beliefs. Uh, there's a very widely known fact that overconfidence is widespread. So people tend to think that they are better than they are. So uh, classical studies show that people feel that they are better drivers than average. In a 77 study, two thirds of teachers said that they are in the top quarter in terms of performance. It's just not possible. But it is widespread. Okay. So now you may think, well, naturally that's, that can't be rational. Because if you are of a confident, you are going to make mistakes you are going to engage in risky uh, decisions and you are going to pay the price for that. Okay. And this idea was pretty put uh, by um, you know, Friedman, Milton Friedman, who as one of the arguments to, 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 to um, support the Homo economicus, uh, Friedman says, you know, the process of natural selection, and he was talking of markets, but you can extend it to any natural selections, mean that he's going to validate the hypothesis of, of maximization of return. If you have irrational actors, they're going to disappear. Because those who have correct beliefs and who maximize the returns for correct beliefs are going to be more successful. That's a key idea which often, you know, when, when the behavioral economist started or the psychologist started questioning the standard framework, the uh, standard economists were saying, but surely you can't be right. I mean, if people were, irra were, were irrational, they would just not be here. So we, we need to be right, right. People have to be rational in the way of, uh, uh, the Homo economicus. But then, uh, suppose you're in this situation. So you play poker, and, and here's your hand. And, and to be frank, it's not a very good hand. Uh, but you know, you think, you know what? I've not been bluffing for quite a while. I think they don't expect me to bluff. 
why don't I try? Why don't I, I, I try to play as if I had a very good hand, hopefully they fold, and you know, I make it work. And instead of folding now, I can gain this hand. So now suppose you're in this, this situation. You want to win and you want to bluff. Uh, who do you want to be? Do you want to be person A? Person A is very aware that the, the game is not very good. So person is going to try very hard to convey confidence, but can't help thinking that the game is not very good. Or do you want to be person B? And person B, if you look through the glasses of person B, person B thinks he has a damn good game. Right. And here the idea is that maybe if you want to convey confidence, if you want to affect the beliefs of the other players, you want to be person B. You want, you want to believe that you have a very good game. Because like that, you don't have to think, oh, I have a bad game, and I have to make people believe I have a good game. If you, yourself you believe you have a good game, it may be even easier to convince other people that you have a good game. And actually, this thing now is very clear. We have results in economics which show that it's the case. Um, the idea of Friedman that uh, competition eliminates false beliefs is just wrong mathematically. Because it works if you're facing natural things. If, if you have to climb a cliff, yes, you should know what your, exactly your chance of success to climb a cliff. But if you play with other people, then now my beliefs can change your beliefs. So there is no necessity that now my false beliefs are bad. If my false beliefs induce you to back down in the competition, it's all good. I have my false beliefs, and I'm a winner. And uh, in this paper in Game Theory, uh, which is a just, just formal model, they show that some degree of distortion in beliefs, it, you, you always find some degree, this is the key, you always find some degree of distortion of beliefs which is beneficial. So it's never the case that the true beliefs are the best one. Some distortion is beneficial because of the resulting effect on open display. And overconfidence in this paper is one specific case. If being overconfident, I get people to back down, it's beneficial. And um, in a, um, psychology and biology, and, and not just in, in, for humans, we have lots of evidence that it's the case. Uh, Self-confidence helps because you, you can convince people uh, that you are worth more, that they should back down, they should give you a bigger share. So but the, then the question is, that if overconfidence is the answer, who is asking the question? Because surely when you, when you are overconfident, you're not thinking, OK, I think I'm 100% today, but I'm going to think I'm 120. That wouldn't work, right? I mean, overconfidence or self-deception doesn't work if you're aware of it. So, how, so it, who is this you who is making these decisions? Well, I think. Uh, if you have kids, you may have seen this movie uh, from Inside Out. If it, I think it's quite insightful about what, you know, the way we really work. We tend to think that we have this commander-in-chief uh, in our mind, and that's a I making executive decisions. Uh, I want to do that, I want to do this, etc. And I'm put in charge of everything. But, uh, but what you have is that you have in, uh, in your brain lots of different processes, pre-processing information, and feeding uh, 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 your, your, your consciousness with uh, lots of information which are already processed. For instance, emotions such as uh, fear or disgust, these are values which are already computed by your brain telling you this is not good, don't try. Okay. And then the, you can imagine the, the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the captain in your brain just receive a report from an advisor and just the report says don't do it. And then the captain says, okay, well, I'm going to follow the report. So who is deciding, really? That's not clear. And here, in this movie, the, the, the little voice are emotions. And that's what emotions do. Emotions help you make good decisions by sending you pre-processed information about options. But you can just add one voice in your head. It's a little advisor which is just giving you the information you need to know to make the right decisions. So you have a little advisor that tells you, know, I think your game is good. I think you should go there. And maybe that's what you need to know, to go in this contest and play as if you have a good game, right? You don't need to know the truth. You, you will be told what you need to know to win this contest. So this is the thing. We think we are deciding, and then uh, if we think like that, we think that being overconfident is a mistake. But if you think that, you know, all the brain processes, even subconscious processes, are just helping you to make the best decisions for you to be successful, you don't need to feel consciously to have consciously the right vision of the world. And in some cases, in many cases, having wrong visions being overconfident is going to be uh, helpful to you. So to conclude, I gave you two examples. I could have got, done lots of other things. But you see that in terms of attention, using limited information is a good use of your limited cognitive resources. And it will allow you to make quick decisions most of the time, but you will have to make some mistakes. So that's a natural price to pay. And self-belief, uh, 
having correct beliefs about the world is not necessarily in your best interest. Right? And so your brain is going to select and process information in a distorted but favorable way all the time. That's it. Thank you. So I, I think I, um, the kind of mistakes I've, I've presented here are mistakes which are like statistically, you know, I said my argument was statistically you should make some mistakes. That's optimal to make some mistakes. So, um, you know, if you, if you serve in tennis, you shouldn't aim for 100% balls in the court. And that's what your brain should do. You should do a lot of mistakes. But I think, uh, but I think there is, a, so, and so these mistakes should typically be in unusual situations. But, but I think that in what we have now also, um, there is a, a, di a difference between the world we, were, we, we evolved in and our brain was selected to, to the kind of problems we are solving and the real world, I mean the, the, the current world. So now we have Twitter, uh, we have, I don't know, uh, we work in huge organizations uh, and you know, be, we, we may be better suited to solve repeat interactions in small groups uh, where there is no necessarily a, a record of what we uh, do uh, forever. And so I can give you a few examples, but oh, and also, uh, uh, also we are making now decisions at a very different time scales. So you know, you invest in your pension, and, and the consequences are going to be in 20, 30 years. And these are other stuff what that our brain was designed to do. And so here you are going to find some systematic inconsistencies, and not because we are bad, but because we are good at answering not this question. Uh, and so, um, the pr for when I talk about the time scale, you have, we have too much preference for the present. And we have new models now which says, well, you should, you know, if, if two more is not certain, you should have more preference for the present. You know, like uh, one bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. That's a very good principle. But, but then now you have banks, and most of the time, kind of banks, you know, if you put money in it, you can get it back. Uh, and so maybe um, we are too cautious. And, and uh, we enjoy, we think, so better use the money now than put it in the bank, and who knows what happens in, in 30 years. So that's one type of things. Another I think, example is that you know, we were not um, designed to work on social media. You know, how many of this case of people uh, writing stuff on social media which are too emotional, or well, you know, if they were thinking about it, they some better not do that. But we, we, we know. Uh, we tend to have uh, emotional reactions and social interactions which are not uh, done to uh, be recorded forever, seen by everybody. <laughs> and so here you see conflicts. Uh, into how we react and uh, to a world which is different from where we were. Uh, so I guess our reactions, in, in social media context, we, we react to someone's reaction, whereas if you're in a remote uh, uh, yeah. situation, you don't get that immediate feedback, so you tend to dive in and, yeah. and think. So. But also, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you say something um, um, not nice to me, typically you're here, yeah. like, like 10,000 years ago, let's say, and, and then I'm here and I'm telling you I'm not happy, and that's it, right? But here in social media, 10 years later, if I say something, you know, a bit, uh, a bit, uh, an outburst, uh, 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 it will still be there. And, and you see there's good reasons why, I mean, I didn't talk about emotions, but for instance, emotions like anger. Uh, anger is a good reason to have anger, because anger uh, helps you to, um, uh, to, to look committed to future actions. So if you, um, if you go to a restaurant and the, 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 the server is not very nice, and they say there's no tip, uh, you know, server is not very nice. Um, if you are Mr. Spock, he doesn't care about what you think because he knows that you're not going to come home and write your negative review because there's no point doing this. Why would you do that? That's over. You're not coming back. But why would you spend time writing a negative review? But if you are visibly angry, you're almost happens, you're visibly angry, you can look committed to do a punishment action. And, and that credible punishment will lead to the fact that, you know, it will ensure cooperation in, in, in the thing. So anger is very useful. 
but anger on team, ideally, you don't have to use anger. It's, it's, it's good that you can use anger so that people know that you can be angry if things go wrong, and because they know that, then they don't, things don't go wrong, right? Um, but then you, this anger, which is useful in small interactions, go into, uh, you know, it's midnight, you're tired, and you're writing something on Twitter, that, that, that's not the optimal answer anymore. Yeah. Is, is there any evidence that our brains are changing to adapt to the modern world, to, you know, to better handle social media or to better handle long-term <coughs> decision making? So, uh, not, not that I know, but, but what I, I would say is unlikely because, I mean, you don't have uh, much uh, selection pressure. First, you have to think that if you take, take the history of the human history, most of the time of human history was uh, living in like seven and small groups, and then uh, if you were to go like, you know, 24 hours with the last few minutes of the day when we are shown these people in huge cities, uh, complex societies. So, you know, that's what we have to think, that we, we are really not designed for this world. But, so I don't think that as a brain where the, there has been the time to, to, to change things, or even the selection pressure to, to change things. But, but what we have is culture. We are very, very uh, good at learning. So, lots of our defaults, we can solve them because we find solutions and, and cultural, institutional solutions to help people do better. And, and when, when you see, like, you know, we have lots of behavioral economic uh, units helping people make better decisions, that's it. So, we have lots of defaults, but, you know, we can create together the institutions and the solutions to help people avoid making these defaults and, and, and compensate these. So, was there one? Oh, Mary, and then there was someone else in the back, wasn't there? Mary, you can I just go back to your uh, comment about the game theory? Um, so, uh, are there sort of like um, research that shows how many iterations of the game that would impact on, say, your own confidence? Like when you start or stop, when does that stop working for you? Like obviously, if it's just one game, then yeah, it might impact on the on the opponent um, that, you know, they'll think that, oh yeah, they're probably telling the truth, but then how many games do you need to, say, be caught or not be caught? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you're, you're um, so it's a technical question. I mean, I, clearly it works in, 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 in one period, and I think you have models where it works in several periods. What you are referring to is obviously the question of credibility. You know, if you stop laughing all the time in poker, you find out that people don't trust you anymore. So you have kind of an optimal way of being uh, uh, overconfident, and and also uh, you should do it when it's done. It should be done smartly. So typically, uh, that's why self self should be done such as you can keep uh, um, uh, uh, keep deniability, you know, credible deniability, which is like. Uh, if you can, if your brain can engage you in, for instance, uh, selection of information, processing of information, which can make that you believe something false, but you, have, you can look like you have a good reason to believe that, then you are not lying. You know, you, you made a mistake, and you know there is a saying: um, if you believe it, it's not a lie. And actually, it's very insightful because if you you are yourself in a situation when you can tell a story, you know, oh yeah, I didn't, I know this is what happened, but I kind of didn't see that. You know, you understand what I mean. And your brain convinces you that it's exactly what happened. Then you're convincible, and you can get out of the you know I try to to bluff on the on, on this thing. So uh, you're completely right. It's a cat, cat and mouse game, right? Because as you try, it's an arm race. As you as you brain processes which help you uh, being self-deceived progress. You have you know people uh, also build up brain processes to try to find out whether people are, are telling crap or whatever. Uh, can I just ask another yeah. question? Um, are you familiar with um, Malcolm Gladwell's book on Blink? Yeah, yeah. Quite, yeah, quite yeah, there are lots of things so, which, yeah. which uh, says the same thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, so he mentioned about thin slicing. You, know, yeah. you, you make decisions based on, you're not looking, processing every single yeah. information, yeah. but the key ones. Has the research done on in which field or under what circumstances that what you should be looking for as the thin slicing? I don't know. It's, um, it's a very large question. I'm not sure I can answer it precisely, but um, the, the only thing I would say, you know, if you look at the video, uh, I asked you, uh, I didn't ask you, but the video setting, when the video starts, it's a police crime video. So you're prompted to think about who is a criminal. But 
Suppose I told you before the video, you know what, think you're a burglar and try to see what you could, you know, what you could get. If you, if you arrive this house tonight, what you could get. You wouldn't see this in the video. You would say, well, wait a minute. There was, there was a guy in this picture and now it's not a guy anymore. It's a horse. Like, what's, what's happening here? Uh, because you would focus on things which are changing and you would see things changing. Uh, there was an experiment when they, they it did exist exactly this there. Describe a house and, and some people, they were asked, uh, you know, um, think that you're a potential buyer. You know, read the description. What do you remember? And all the people says, think that you're a potential burglar. Mm -hmm. And then they ask them afterwards, the potential burglars, they think, oh, they are, I think there's a leakage in the, you know, the, the uh, uh, plumber. I would have to play a plumber because there's some uh, leakage in the bathroom. That's what I remember of this house. And the, uh, and the people who are burglars remember that there's some jewelry in the room uh, when, when you visit. You know, uh, you, you see, you slice information relative to what kind of decisions you have to make. And your brain is going to fade away the irrelevant information, focus on extract the most relevant information for you to make the right decisions. Uh, so, uh, Lano, can I get you to comment on Brexit? <laughs> yeah, really so what's the link? I'm really thinking that, that, you know, this is one of the examples. Before Brexit, I was saying, well, you know, everybody, all economists will say that would be wrong, don't do it, they were providing the numbers. And, and yeah, the emotions took over, the social media took over, and there is a Brexit. Um, so there is a situation where all this framing, you know, led to an equilibrium, which is Brexit. Um, so somehow we couldn't come through, uh, maybe because we didn't have the right framing. Right. Okay, so I'll try, it's a, it's a bit of a stretch, but I'll try to link with, with the presentation. Um, so there's another area in behavioral economics, broadly speaking, which has emerged over the last 10 years, is, um, uh, or 15 years, is the study of identity. Uh, you know, uh, George Akalov and, and, and Rachel Crunchon has worked on identity, and identity, well, was a topic which was really outside of, you know, Mr. Spock doesn't have an identity side. Uh, he doesn't feel a bone to uh, his uh, fellow, uh, I mean, maybe he does, but you know, we know models, he didn't. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, when you look at the world, people go in football stadium and they start beating each other for no, you know, no rational reasons, if you think about it. Um, people go to war with their neighbors, if you think of former Yugoslavia, etc. So, identity, uh, Seems like there is things about identity, plenty of, of things. So, um, if you think now the, the world of 10,000 years ago, you know, uh, um, we have lots of coordination problems to solve, uh, ensuring that we cooperate today, uh, uh, lots of public goods where you know, uh, uh, the, the critical um, uh, challenges are avoiding free riding, because if you free ride, I free ride, nobody does anything. Uh, make sure that we agree on, you know, if we need to all go left because that's, you know, there's a battle there and we all go left, so we need coordination. And, 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 and as, you know, if we think as a, in game theory, this is very difficult because people have different incentives. Maybe I have incentives for you go and fight this tribe while, you know, I kind of wait on the side while the stuff is finished and, and I benefit from whatever happens. So identity is kind of one of the kind of things which help people bonding feel collectively and act collectively, and, and that may have been uh, uh, selected for this reason. Then now, fast forward in the current society, and you know, we're not anymore in small groups, but we still have these feelings. And so you have these, uh, these, these things like identity, and if you look at Brexit, uh, the case was not, I'm, in my opinion, the case was not about economics. Uh, I lived four years in Britain, and, and as a continental European living in Britain, uh, I felt there was really a case of, um, you know, after the war, countries in continental Europe has kind of mo have moved on. They're, they've accepted that they are not anymore the former powers. Uh, Germany, for obvious reasons, but even a country like France, they realize you know they are not they are not anymore what they were. They, they need to move on. They need to move together. And I think the history, in some ways, winning the war is a bit of uh, for Britain uh, being clearly a winner of the war is a bit of um, um, uh, a difficulty because mentally, then you don't have to make this move and say, you know, we're not that great anymore. And I think this identity is this thing that, you know, when I was in Britain, I never saw as many um, war documentary in my life. It's like, you turn, it's war documentary, it's Battle of Britain, Battle of Britain. And when you're in France, it's, it's more like, you know, we like the German because now we're friends. So, well, in Britain, they don't, don't like the German, but they, they put a lot of war documentaries in uh, And I think that what you have, you have this, and you see who voted for uh, Brexit. It's not London, which is multicultural and international. It's, um, it's the Middle England, which carries this kind of English pride. 
and the urban project appear as a kind of uh, uh, things which is going to take your sovereignty and your identity as a former great, great power, and you have the pound, and we, you know, they want to take us away with bond reforms, and, and then added to that, you have the migrant crisis, and I think all these these things, you know, that's uh, identity kicked in and, and, and played a role in this thing. But and, and to finish, you know, I'm a big fan of British TV series because. Uh, in spite of what I said, I love the country. It was a great experience to live in Britain. Um, if you uh, know Yes Minister, there is a great episode where the Brexit is Brexit kind of written in it. There's a minister, prime minister says, oh, we love Europe, the European Union, our brothers. And the advisor says, no, 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 minister. We didn't go in Europe because of our brothers. We, we went in Europe to divide the French from the German. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add, though, that I think you could say overconfidence? is part of that because I think part of that Brexit case, rather than saying we hate Europe, we don't like migrants, we all of those things, it was all of this money is going out, we can keep this money and we can spend it on the national health. And then if they believe that, it's not a lie, but it was a lie, mm -hmm. and they're not going to spend it on, and money was coming back that, you know, so then people could think it is rational and a good thing to vote to get out and it's not because I'm racist. So it almost could feel into you. Yeah. Um, what am I? Oh, you can. Yeah. You guys can. Um, is this related to um, the question around brain changing and you saying that we're very good at learning, um, but we uh, still observe uh, differences in this, uh, the type of mistakes people make depending on the social gradient. So people at the lower end, poorer people, tend to use limited information as much probably as the others, but they use the wrong information and perhaps they make the wrong choices when it comes to selecting into higher education or you know making a financial choice, they have stresses that are different. What are the insights uh, that you can give related to this and whether there are policies that could be implemented to kind of level uh, the right limited number of information. Yeah. So it's an interesting question. It's also a difficult question, but it's true you have a, an area of, of behavioral economics. I'm not sure it's behavioral economics as such, like limited behavioral economics, but um, Duflo, for instance, at the, the MIT, she worked at uh, poor but rational, question mark. And the idea of here in this area is that, you know, if you limitations of cognitive limitations um, can impair, you know, can make you sometimes to make mistakes, can lead to you making mistakes. Uh, maybe if you're in institutions where you know you're more poor, you're you're actually more constrained. Um, maybe, for instance, your cognitive resources are, are used to you. You're worried about your tomorrow. So some of your, uh, you know, instead of being uh, I don't care about tomorrow, so I can I can think about uh, positive investment plans. You can't think about investment plans because you you want to first to think about I can secure that I can get my job or that um, I can pay for. Uh, uh, my rent next next month. So uh, this research tried to think whether indeed to look whether indeed uh, poverty and poor conditions actually uh, worsen the decision making process. And and and, and there is some evidence that is that it can be the case. Yeah. Okay. I might ask a question. Yeah. And we'll wrap up soon after this if we can. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering, what are a couple of examples of? the applications of behavioral economics to policy and business, what do you think would be the best examples? Well, I think there's a great example by uh, Richard Thaler. He, he contributed to, um, you know, I said that one big problem we have is that we're not designed to, to work with huge time frames. And so we have, in, in plenty of situations, we have this um, conflict between the fact that if I ask you, you want to save money, yes, you think it's good. Yes. You want to have a healthy diet, you think it's good. You don't want to smoke. Uh, you know, you want to do all this good thing. Uh, if you're a student, you want to have good grades at the exam. But then when I tell you, okay, but well, that means that you know you need to eat um, uh, less sugar, you need to work tonight uh, in your exam, uh, you need to save money now instead of going on holiday. You say, okay, uh, I think it's good. I'll, I'll do it next month because uh, this month I have a very important holiday to do. But I hear what you say, and next month, uh, that's on my to-do list. And then the next month is a new today, and you, you know you have all the things competing, etc. And so. Uh, Richard Thaler has a very good initiative. He, he, did, um, uh, he created this um, uh, save more for tomorrow. So, you know, your current money, you don't want to save, but then the future money, when you have an increase, you're not thinking about it. So, but if I tell you, well, next time you have a raise increase, or maybe just like 2% a year, you, you get, 
uh, let's take half of it and, and, and put it in, in your savings. You say, yeah, I, I sign now. And then next month or next year, you get 1% instead of 2 and mm -hmm. you know, it's just completely normal. You don't have to make a decision. And that worked well, very well to improve people's saving. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, are there any more questions? We might have time for one more before we wrap up. Anyone? Or one last yeah. one? Um, yes. I know some behavioral economics looks at um, MRI and imaging and brain imaging. Um, and I skimmed over an article recently which a Swedish group who actually noted that they found um, a problem in the programming of a lot of those MRI um, programs. Okay. How much does that actually um, draw into question a lot of the reports that have been done in the past? And has that made an impact at all? So, uh, first, whatever I said today was not based on, yeah. on fMRI. So, uh, I think fMRI, uh, it's, it's, it's great, but also we have to be uh, kind of, um, aware of its limitation. I mean, the fMRI to this is, is great because we can observe things we're not able to observe. The brain is complex and, you know, you can't slice a brain and put it back together. And, okay. So, the fMRI, um, usually you have a, a blood flow in your brain, and, and when part of your brain works more, they need more oxygen because that's the um, uh, fuel for uh, cells working. So blood flows go, bring the oxygen, and the oxygenation in part of the brain change the magnetic properties of, of like, you know, in 3D your brain. So the fMRI uh, kind of slice of brain, identify lots of small little cubes, and compute the magnetic properties of the little cubes, and identify where there's activity. And it's like, yeah, the fMRI, it's a study like fMRI is like an alien looking at the city of Brisbane. It's like, how does Brisbane work? Okay. So uh, we see there's a flood, and where are the light turned on? Oh, the light is turned on like, you know, the, the, the town hall office. OK, maybe the town hall has to do something with dealing with the flood. Okay? That's not very precise. Right? Um, but that's much better than, we, than before. So, um, so that's limited, but better. And what you have is that the, the statistical techniques to use the, uh, is still under construction. So it's, it's, it's not all, I, I don't know the specific study you have, but I know there have been like debates about, you know, uh, you have studies and they say this is significant, but is it really significant or is it by chance? And actually you redo it again and there was nothing. You know, if you do plenty of studies, you'll find something by chance. Um, so, so this is just normal scientific debate. I think that we get, we've got plenty of insights from neuroscience, but we just have to be aware that it has to be limited. Uh, so it's great, but limited. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Lyle. That was fantastic. Um, um, the, we were really pleased that um, uh, the, the Queensland branch of the Society would nominate Lionel for the Young Economist Award um, and delighted that if they, on a national level, that was very properly accepted and, and without hesitation. So the award um, is not given every year, so it's, it's very selective. So I think. Uh, it's delightful you've been recognised. I think your presentation today gave people here a sense of why that was such an appropriate award. So thank you, Lyle. We, we appreciate it. We have something to give oh. to you, which, which I, is... I hit it under the table. You hit it under the table. <laughs> 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 so very well hidden, actually. Yes. Um, I didn't see it. Yet. <laughs> so very good. Always a good thing to But uh, well, thank, thank you, Lyle. Excellent. Thank you, Julian. But please show appreciation to Lyle again. So. And, uh, and the, these events don't happen by chance, so uh, Jean Tardy and Harriet Smith were uh, kindly uh, pulled us together, so, so, uh, so thank you for making it work smoothly. Um, we have some more events coming up, if I can... Um, ...organised by society. So on the 11th of October, um, the chair of the Queensland Competition Authority, Professor Roy Green, is speaking um, on challenges in economic regulation in Queensland, so a very topical theme, um, and that's being held uh, um, at Minter Ellison. Um, and we'll have some details about that up on our website uh, uh, on Monday, all going well. Um, and the next scheduled event after that um, is jointly with Griffith um, uh, on a half-day workshop um, on computable general equilibrium models. Um, which will um, uh, look at the theory and some of the applications and some of the problems in the application of, of CGE models. So, um, uh, and uh, that's being offered at um, 
you know, a very moderate cost for a very you know, useful piece of professional development. So that's the, the two things on our agenda so far, and um, we're a bit lean of uh, quick to move, so there may be other things developed uh, as well, but that's uh, the two. And, and um, the, the um, uh, uh, QCA uh, one will be up on our website on Monday, the, the, uh, the uh, one on the 18th of November in a week or so's time, but uh, keep an eye for that. Um, look, a number of people here are members, members of society, which we appreciate. Um, uh, those who aren't, perhaps you may consider joining. It's a very, very reasonable cost. And uh, uh, with um, Lions Green, we'll send out to you the, the slides from today. Um, we may have some problem with the video, given the file size and so on, but we'll send out the slides and some information on membership. So thank you for coming, and thanks to Jean and Harriet for organising. And Lionel, thank you, Lions.